Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. My name is Dr. Maria wheeler Dubas. I am the Science Education Outreach Manager at Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And on behalf of the Heinz organizations, I have the pleasure of opening up our events today to celebrate Gabe Brown as a Heinz Award recipient for his outstanding accomplishments in regenerative agriculture. The Heinz Awards were created more than 25 years ago by Teresa Heinz to honor the memory of her late husband, U.S. Senator John Heinz. The awards, administered by the Heinz Family Foundation, recognize individuals whose vision and spirit produce achievements of lasting good in three fields that were important to the senator, the arts, the economy, and the environment. Senator Hines was a husband, father, philanthropist, art lover, outdoorsman, and environmentalist. His broad systems use, coupled with his devotion to practical problem solving, ultimately set him apart, helping, to help, helping him to forge a new and enduring vision for aligning environmental and economic interests based on sound science and thoughtful policymaking. Above all, Senator Hines possessed a belief that through determination and hard work, he could make the world a better place. And today, that legacy continues with the Heinz Awards, established to celebrate the vision and spirit that produced achievements of lasting good. These 26th annual awards bring the total number of recipients to 158 and reflect more than $30 million given since the program was launched in 1993. The Heinz Award in the Environment honors individuals who, like John Heinz, have confronted environmental concerns with a spirit of innovation and who demonstrate a similar blend of action and creativity in approaching the protection of our environment. Today, the Heinz Award just honor Gabe Brown, whose work in the field of regenerative agriculture meets every benchmark measure of value of the Heinz Award. Gabe's work is significant, not a quick fix. It is already shown to be enduring. It is creative and innovative, and it is already a model for farmers all over the world. And yet for all the power and potential in Gabe's work, his efforts have flourished because Gabe himself embodies the key criteria of personal characteristics that have defined all past Heinz Award recipients. A passion for excellence, a concern for humanity, broad vision and gritty determination to persevere and see the work through. Now, we're going to learn more about Gabe through conversation in just a moment, but first and foremost, let us recognize that Gabe is a farmer and a pioneer in regenerative agriculture and soil health, and he catalyzed the movements to change land use practices. He began this journey in an attempt to save his own 5,000 acre farm from ecological and economic demise. But along the way, he turned his farm into a highly profitable ecosystem that captures carbon and supports surrounding wildlife. His firsthand farming experience and passion for sharing his journey are inspiring farmers to shift from conventional to regenerative practices, transforming farmland from an environmental problem to a solution and changing the mindsets of farmers and scientists and the corporate food industry. He reaches thousands of farmers annually by speaking, consulting, and conducting soil health sessions. And his book, Dirt to Soil, One Family's Journey into Regenerative Agriculture, has become a key resource for both novice and seasoned farmers. And also joining us in conversation today, we have Peter Bick, a professor of practice at Arizona State University in both the School of Sustainability and the Cronkite School of Journalism. He is the director, producer, and writer of the documentaries Carbon Nation and Carbon Cowboys, which explores regenerative grazing. He is also currently co-leading a research project on adaptive multi-paddock grazing, collaborating with 20 scientists and 10 researchers focused on soil health and soil carbon storage, biodiversity, water cycling, and much more. He's also making a documentary on this research called Roots So Deep. Now, I'm really excited to get us started for this afternoon, but I would just like to cover a few brief housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, first, this event is being recorded, and the recording, along with any resources shared today, will be shared with all attendees. We will have a Q&A during today's conversation, so please feel free to ask a question at any point. To ask a question, we ask that you use the chat box feature. 
Uh, if you're having technical difficulties, like you can't hear us or see the slides, please use the raise hand feature. And as a reminder, all participant lines are muted, so please use the chat box feature to share your questions and comments. And now I'm excited, Gabe and Peter, I will turn it over to the two of you, and I'm greatly learning to learning from both of you and chatting with both of you this afternoon. Thanks, Maria. Gabe, how are you, sir? Good. Thank you, Maria. Pleasure to be here today. I'd like to thank the Heinz Award folks for, for honoring Gabe and for, for letting me be a part of this. Uh, and to honor Gabe is to honor nature, to honor working with nature. Gabe is a, is a, is a part of it. He would, he's not the whole thing. He's, he's, he's a conduit for learning what nature wants us to do. So to celebrate Gabe is to celebrate nature. And that's why I'm here today. Um, Gabe, what was your aha moment? What was the moment or moments where you went from chemical conventional agriculture to regenerative? What steered you or who? Sure, Peter. First, I want to thank the Heinz Foundation, Teresa Heinz, for, for awarding me this. It was, uh, it was really a shock to me when I got that call. And I think most importantly, I'd like this to, to bring awareness to regenerative agriculture and the, the hope that Regen Ag brings with it. So to answer your question, Peter, good to be with you again. And there wasn't a single moment, but what happened for me, I had the distinct blessing that I grew up in town. I did not grow up a farmer or a rancher. So because of that, I was always one that wanted to learn. And so uh, everything was new to me and I, I would study about agriculture and practices such as no-till. But what really changed me was during the mid nineties, we had four years in a row of natural disasters, three years of hail and a year of drought and essentially no crop production to sell. And the banker wasn't gonna loan me money anymore. And it was like, okay, this is real. How am I gonna survive? What am I gonna do in order to pay my bills? And after four years of natural disasters, there was a lot of them, and yet support a family and make a living. So my aha moment was one learning how to work with nature instead of against her. And I tell people going through those four years were extremely difficult, but my wife and I will tell you it's a, it, it is absolutely the best thing that could have happened to us because it sent us on a journey and that journey is regenerative agriculture. So along the way, you're you're at the forefront of, of a movement. There's people behind you for cent, you know for decades and centuries, sure. But you're at this new inflection point. What mistakes did you make? And 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 what did you learn from those mistakes? Never made a single mistake, Peter. Awesome. <laughs> Just a <laughs> lot of learning opportunities, as we like to call them. You know, my son who operates this ranch now, him and I always joke that uh, we're not doing things right if we don't fail at several things every year, because that means we're not trying hard enough to work in harmony and synchrony with nature. So I can't really talk about one specific mistake. There's just things we learned and learn along the way. And it, you know, you can't be afraid of making those mistakes or you're not gonna advance. The important things is what do you learn from them and what's your takeaway? And then how do you adapt and adjust? Who were your teachers? Were you uh, out in the vacuum learning this stuff the hardest way or did you learn from people as well? Well, my teachers were all those who came before me and realized that, that we can learn things from the past. Uh, I tell people I'm so far into this that, you know, internet wasn't around when I started this. So I had to go to the library and look up through the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> that'll, that'll tell you how old I am and read about how things were done in the past. I remember uh, reading Thomas Jefferson's old journals, what he did on, uh, on at Monticello. I remember reading Indian Bird Woman's Garden and reading about uh, how the indigenous peoples farmed 
in my environment centuries ago. And so I learned things from them. And then there's a lot of people I need to give credit to. I tell people, Gabe Brown isn't very smart, but I know a lot of smart people. And it's what I could learn from them. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Jay Fear, who was the district conservationist with NRCS uh, in Burley County for a long time. I got to meet him and he had a passion for learning and we quickly became good friends. Dr. Dwayne Beck, Dr. Chris Nichols. I still remember as if it was yesterday, the first time Chris came to my farm, and she looked at my soils and she said, Gabe, you're moving in the right direction, but your soils will never be as good as they could be if you keep using all these synthetics. And so we had a long discussion about, can I really wean myself off of many of those synthetics? And she challenged me to do so, and I did. And then I learned from people like Ken Miller and our friend Neil Dennis and David Brandt, and there's many, many others. And now today, you know, I can literally pick up the phone and call every state and every country and talk to people about regenerative agriculture. And I learned something from all of them. One of the things um, that I learned from you was the idea of a stacked enterprise, that you could grow a crop, graze animals, grow another crop. And then one thing you said to me uh, was that you could have your animals fertilize your land for a profit mm -hmm. as opposed to a cost. What is stacked enterprises and, and, and how come more people aren't using their land in such a way? Yeah, and I'll never forget a conversation I had with my son. I was, he was away to college and he calls me up one day and he says, uh, dad, you know, you preach diversity yet the only animals we really have are beef cattle. Well, he said, I wanna have chickens and sheep and." and pigs, and I'm going, what could I say? Makes perfect sense to me. And what we learned over time, we didn't add all those species at once. We grew as our knowledge grew, but the way to generate real ecosystem health and thus profitability is by the synergies that take place. You know, for instance, cattle and sheep tend to eat different species. So they actually complement each other and enhance the ecosystem. Also, we raise grain. Well, if you combine grain, there's always some weed seeds, some cracked and broken kernels. That's the perfect feed for a poultry operation. So we're producing much more, uh, more quantity of nutrient-dense food per acre than we would if we were in a monoculture type system. But, but so many, and, and your, your area is not irrigated as well. Is that correct? You're just dealing with rainfall? Yeah, we, we get approximately 18 inches of total precipitation per year here. No irrigation at all. And to produce all that food, I would say a lot of people would have said that that was impossible before you were doing it because no one was doing it. Yet it makes so much sense to see it happen. Well, think back, you know, and, and look at history and study what were the Great Plains, for instance, of the United States here, like centuries ago. Did they only have one species growing on them, one type of grass? No, they had grasses and forbs and legumes, 150 plus different species. And did they only have one kind of animal? No, they had bison and elk and deer and bear and wolves. And, you know, we've gotten away from that. So to me, agriculture today is all about mankind trying to impose his or her will on nature. Why don't we work with nature instead of against her? Let's talk about animal impact. A lot of people don't want to eat animals, don't want people to eat animals. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we build soil in, in any better way than with the animals. Can you, do you agree with that? Can you talk to that? Sure. Uh, one of my mentors, of course, and a friend of yours, Peter, is the late Neil Dennis. And I remember the first time in 2007, I went up to Neil's in Wawota, Saskatchewan, and I, I saw what he was doing with high stock density. And he had taken farmland, let it revert back to perennials. 
And I, I understood doing that. But I'll never forget, I was driving home and I just crossed through the border and it hit me. I says, Gabe, that's the missing link on cropland. We have to start integrating livestock more on the cropland. Now, up until that point, I was putting a cattle on my cropland after I harvested a cash crop, but I needed to integrate them further. I needed to grow some cover crops and integrate livestock, high stock densities to enhance soil function. Because think back ecologically, if you were in on the Serengeti, you had large herds of wiz, wildebeest and antelope. Here in the in North America, you had the bison and elk that were migrating, moving, being pushed by predators. We need to use animals then, uh, our domesticated livestock, to replace that. And I often get asked that question: Can we enhance soil health without animals, grazing animals? And I tell people. Yes, we can advance soil health, but make no mistake about it. It will never be as healthy as where you can integrate animals. Where in nature do you find a healthy functioning ecosystem without animals and insects? You're not gonna find one. That's yeah. the answer. And Neil, Neil showed me how he built up soil so fast. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and uh, yeah, we miss Neil Dennis. So, We've danced around it a little bit, but let's talk about soil health. You know, what does soil health mean to you? Where's carbon and water in this equation? Mm -hmm. If I had to sum soil health up in one word, it'd be simply life. You know, I tell people when I farmed and ranched conventionally in the conventional mindset, I woke up every day trying to decide what I was going to kill that day. Was it going to be a weed? Was it going to be a pest? Was it going to be a fungal disease? I was going to kill something. Now I wake up every day, how do I get more life on my branch? What can I do as a steward of this ecosystem to enhance that? So regenerative agriculture is all about working in harmony and synchrony with nature to restore, revitalize and rebuild our natural ecosystem, starting with the life below ground and moving to all life above ground. Because our existence and the existence of everything on this planet relies on that soil. And we have to have a healthy functioning soil ecosystem. Healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy people. Why do you think that soil itself is such a mystery to even the most forward-thinking farmers? It, it, it's, it's an unknown entity for so many people. I was just being interviewed on, on Wednesday, and I was asked the question, how many farmers understand that soil is really a biological ecosystem? And I had to answer honestly, and I really believe it's less than 1%. Yeah. Think of it this way, in a teaspoonful of healthy soil, there's more microorganisms than there are people on this planet. So every time you walk across to healthy soil, you're stepping on top of another universe. And, you know, Peter, in your work, you have highlighted that so well. But we as stewards of this earth need to focus on that and realize that the health of everything above the ground depends on the health of those below. So it's a, it's a lack of education. And... So often I think that's missed. We, we don't educate ourselves as farmers, as ranchers, even as, as gardeners, you know, or consumers. Our health as consumers depends on the health of the soil. Well, let's, let's jump right to that. Um, consumers, I remember a moment with you and Paul and I uh, on sort of your native species field and, and you were saying, Peter's, this and that, farmers can help, but consumers are the ones who are gonna drive the change. Mm -hmm. um, do consumers have that power and they just don't know it? Look at the, look at agriculture today. Why is agriculture today the way it is? It's because of consumers. Consumers were demanding large quantities of low cost food. 
And I would contend it's not really food, it's food-like substances. <laughs> you know, much of what we consider food today, in my mind, isn't really food. One of the projects that we're really focused on at Understanding Ag is how do we quantify the nutrient value of food that's grown in and on healthy soils and compare that to what's being done today? And you're involved in that, Peter. And, and it's a, there's a major difference in the phytonutrient compounds that are in those foods. And unfortunately, today it's being brought to light by this current COVID pandemic. Those who are unfortunately succumbing to COVID most often have a compromised immune system. Well, that means their gut microbiome is not healthy. Well, what gives us a healthy gut microbiome is all of those phytonutrients that come about from the life in the soil. So we need to get back to focusing on that. So can consumers play a part? Absolutely. If they insist and source food that's grown in a regenerative manner, they're not going to only enhance their own life. They're going to change farming and ranching practices and thus have a major impact on the world. One of the criticisms of regeneratively grown food or organic food is it's expensive, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, things that people praise about a lot of other foods is that it's cheap. And, and we just spent $4 trillion last year on healthcare in the United States. Mm -hmm. So connect food with health and is cheap food cheap? <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. The United States, for example, spends more on healthcare per person than any other country in the world. Yet we're at the top or near the top in ADD, ADHD, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autoimmune diseases, cancer, obesity, osteoporosis, and the list goes on. Why is that? Well, it gets back to what I said earlier. I don't think we have food anymore. We have food-like substances. And we need to get back to thinking of food as health. And we need to have the, the tools and the ability to accurately inform consumers as to what is in their food. Dr. Stefan Van Vliet, Duke University Medical Center, using a mass spectrometer can measure over 2,500 different phytonutrient compounds. The work we're doing with him shows that there's a tremendous difference in the, um, the uh, variability, the, the array, I should say, of these phytonutrients and the quantity of phytonutrients in food, depending on the soil that it's grown in. Uh, Peter knows my life is spent traveling more in an airport and an airplane and and uh, I'm on the road 280 plus days a year. Well, if somebody should get sick, it should be Gabe Brown, you know, for, for all that I'm exposed to. Yet, rarely do I ever get sick. And why is that? Is because I take my own food with me and I eat food that's grown and raised in, in healthy soils. So think of if we did that as a society, started paying attention to how food was grown and raised and using food as medicine. That, that money that you just reported was spent, think of it, it could be used elsewhere where it's really needed. Well, it could be used on helping farmers make this transition, mm -hmm. you know, to making the transition from a, 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 a type of farming that they've been trained in, no fault of theirs, but it's, it's, it's hurting them, it's hurting the farmers. Mm -hmm. Farmers themselves are high up on the list of, of, of suicide rates in the UK and the United States. They're like third. Uh, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. But again, that comes about because of consumer demand. And then in turn, it is you don't know what you don't know. I didn't know about the six principles of soil health. I didn't know about the four ecosystem processes before I had those four years of natural disasters. Farmers and ranchers are not learning this. It's not being taught in our universities. It's not being taught in the media. 
we need to change that narrative. And that's why I'm so thankful of this award to be able to help bring the word out and make people aware of the importance of regenerative agriculture. For all involved and, and diversity is a real driving force in everything, right? Diversity of the soil microbial community, diversity of the plant life, animals, diversity of the farmer knowledge and farmer communities. Do you, do you think along those lines, how diversity is such a key aspect of everything? It amazes me as I travel just how monoculture of plants, animals, we are. Look at our human diets. Uh, I've heard it said that if you walk into a typical grocery store, 80% of the products in there have corn and soybeans in them. Okay, how is that diverse? Yet look at indigenous populations, what they consume, tremendously diverse diets and the phytonutrients that were in there because of the healthy soil. Now look at unfortunately what their health is like today, okay? They're not getting that diversity of nutrients, we're not. Diversity is key, whether we're talking biology, plants, animals, or our diets. Friends, <laughs> the whole thing. So a lot of folks think uh, oh, regenerative agriculture is cute. It works on that little farm and it'll never scale. The whole argument of you have to feed the world, like Will Harris, your brother from a different mother always says, you know, I just have to feed my community. I don't have to feed the world. Mm -hmm. Let's just go down that road. You know where I'm going. Yeah. And, and those who think regenerative agriculture cannot scale, what was the world like prior to mankind's intervention? Was that not regenerative? The whole world was regenerative. So don't, don't give me that. Okay, now as far as feeding the world, it's not often I'd admit that Will is correct, but he's correct in that statement <laughs> in that we don't need to feed the world. The world needs to feed itself. Look at some of the issues that have arose when we try and impose our diets on a certain population. Okay, that's not good. We need to get away from that. Uh, Diversity. The fact of the matter is, as I stated earlier, I produce much, much more nutrients per acre than a conventional farm. I'm going to feed the world way before conventional farming and ranching will feed it. Besides, we really do not have a food shortage in the world. Now, we have issues with logistics, transportation, etc. But Last statistics I saw were from 2019, we produced enough food to feed 10.1 billion people. Well, there's approximately 7.9 billion people on earth today. So we produce plenty of food. Now I'm gonna argue that it's not really nutrient dense food, but that's not the issue. The issue is how and what we're producing and consuming. So the idea of scale to you um, would be more about education rather than capability of land to produce more food. It's education, letting farmers know, now I'm talking my own opinion, letting farmers know that this exists. Um, go ahead, and then I've got something to follow up with that. Well, I, I think you're exactly right, Peter. It's really, you know, one of the real joys I get is traveling on farms and ranches, and I have the good fortune, I travel all over the world, I'm on hundreds of farms and ranches every year, and when a farmer has that aha moment, so to speak, and the light bulb comes on and they realize, yes, this makes sense, then it's, a, it's about, okay, let's take the education further. Now we have their attention, let's take it further. And once they start down this path, it's life-changing. You know, it's life-changing uh, for the ecosystem, it's life-changing for their profitability, and it's life-changing for their family and community. Well, let's, let's, um, let's go right to community. Let's go to rural economies and, and, and how uh, so much money has been sucked out of rural economies through the way we've gone down the road of, of the way we're growing our food. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do we get our rural economies thriving again? 
Is it possible? Now, you mentioned Will Harris er earlier. You only have to look at what Will's done in Bluffton, Georgia, to see that someone can truly make a difference in their rural community. And you're exactly right that this current production model is one based on extraction. And part of that is extraction, is extraction, extracting the wealth from rural America. There's no shortage of young people who want to farm and ranch, just that it's difficult in this current production model. One thing we see though, in a regenerative manner and model, it's much more profitable and it's much easier to bring in more people. Dr. Jonathan Lundgren in his work at the Ecdysis Foundation has found that regenerative farms are 78% higher in profitability. That allows young people the opportunity to enter into this business. And that's something I think we need to encourage because that will revitalize our small towns. And banks, when they get that, that knowledge, you would think that they would be more apt to loan to folks working in a, in a type of agriculture that's actually more apt to pay them back, right? You're exactly right. One of the things we're working on is to prove out and document and show, be able to show financial institutions, be able to show insurance companies that those who farm and ranch in this manner deserve to be uh, able to take out loans at a lower interest rate because they're right. going to have higher repayment capacity. Yep. They're going to, they should be able to insure at lower premiums because yep. farming and ranching res, uh, regeneratively builds resiliency into a farmer ranch and they're much less apt to suffer from those natural disasters. Well, let's talk natural disasters. So you're, you live in Bismarck, North Dakota. Uh, you got the Missouri River going through there. I, I like to think about if, if all the farmers in Bismarck or in Burley County went to a regenerative practice, that the rains that are becoming heavier and deeper and faster would soak into that soil quicker and probably mitigate flooding downstream. And the Missouri goes into the Mississippi. So it's a, it's a, it's a system. Do you agree, disagree? No, oh, I, I couldn't agree more. And we see that, you know, as we travel around, one of the first things we do when we walk in a farm and ranch, obviously we have a shovel with and we look at soil, but then we do an infiltration test. How fast can that water infiltrate into the soil? And I remember Jay Fear back in 1991 when, when my wife and I bought this ranch, doing an infiltration test on our ranch, which showed we could only infiltrate a half of an inch of rainfall per hour. So that meant anytime we had a rain event, and oftentimes here in the Northern Plains, you'll get a thunderstorm, we'll dump an inch or two at a time, and that's gonna run off and it's gonna carry precious topsoil and nutrients with it. Now today, because of regenerative practices, uh, just here two years ago, Dr. John Norman, a world famous soil scientist was here, uh, using a dual head infiltrometer, which is a very uh, specific device to measure water infiltration, showed that on our ranch, we can infiltrate 30 inches of rainfall per hour. Okay? 30 inches? 30 inches. Now realize Bismarck, North Dakota has never, ever, not once, recorded 30 inches in a year, right. let alone in an hour. But think of what that does. That means essentially that every raindrop that falls in my brittle environment is gonna infiltrate into the soil. And then due to the amount of carbon we have in our soils, it's gonna be held there for when the plant needs it. That mitigates flooding downstream. And it also makes me very resilient to drought. We, uh, in our big research uh, work that we're doing in the Southeast US, one of our uh, adaptive multi-paddock grazing farmers talks about how much dew he has in his land and does that get counted in the uh, in the precipitation I mean you walk through any of those fields and your pants are soaked mm -hmm. you know in the growing season does that get counted the sure. dew? I, I'll, I tell the story that back in 2013 we hosted the grass-fed exchange on our ranch and we had 600 plus people here for a tour that day 
and it was record heat, 108 degrees. I was there. And they walked into the cover crop and it was wet underneath. And they were like, how can this be in this heat? But you create your own microclimate and realize that's the way it should be. It should be that way on earth. You know, we should have the diversity and that healthy of an ecosystem that that small water cycle is working and providing water. Yeah, it's pretty astounding. Uh, the difference in temperature of soil if you just have a plant growing on top of it, yeah. which is protecting all the microbes, right? Mm -hmm. Now your son, Paul, he works on, well, he's running your ranch right now. Did you ever worry that you were gonna go down the road of a son who didn't follow and work on the farm? Because a lot of children aren't following in their parents' footsteps right now on farms. I never once doubted. But even if Paul would not have wanted to, it's okay. You know, children need to choose their own path. But if neither of my children wanted to take over this ranch, we would have, my wife and I would have found someone who was interested in doing it. And that's fine. Now, Paul, from when he was young, I knew that's all he wanted to do was be on the ranch. And he did take the ranch over about three years ago. And he's going to take this ranch much further than we ever did. Um, you know, we, we were talking about who were your teachers earlier, and I certainly wouldn't know you without Alan Williams. You know, he introduced me to you. And you were talking about the work out of Duke University, and Fred Provenza is, is, is that Mr. Dr. Van Fleet's teacher. Um, let's talk about your students. Right now, you're, you're really transitioning into being a teacher. And with understandingag.com and soilhealthacademy.org, your for-profit and not-for-profit arms of your all's organization, talk about teaching and, and, and students, that, I, that whole concept. Yes, it's, a, it's ironic. And uh, you bring up Alan, who is now one of my business partners, and the fact that he, for years, was a teacher. Well, little known fact about me is I went to school to be an uh, instructor in vocational agriculture. That's where I thought my in in agriculture was. And now we spend a lot of time educating. And, you know, what I wouldn't have given for during those four years to have the somebody to just help nudge me in the right direction and, and guide me. And it's a real joy for us to be out and people ask who our students are. And we often say, anyone and everyone who will listen. You know, when the, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is we, we will work with any person, any community, any business, any organization, because we want to bring everyone together. We have a saying at Understanding Ag and Soil Health Academy. We're going to work for on common to find common ground for common good. People have much more in common than you might think. You know, so often now on the news, all you hear is about this divisiveness and this, this rift in society. It's not like that, though. All of us can come together and agree there's too much carbon in the atmosphere, not enough in the soil. We can all agree as to the importance of clean air and clean water and water quality and quantity. We can all agree that we need to revitalize our communities, both rural and inner city. And we can certainly all agree that we need to do what's necessary to focus on the human health crisis that we have. So why can't we come together for the good of those things? And that's what regenerative agriculture affords. It's an opportunity for us to come together as a society. And it also brings us a tremendous amount of hope. Yeah. And as I was always hunting for solutions to climate change, this is where I landed. This is where my research landed. And, and meeting you and Alan and Neil in 2012 was life-changing for me. And then there's other people whose lives have changed as a result. Um, yeah, Peter, and meeting you is life-changing for everyone. So <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's a good thing. It um, is. One of the most amazing things that I've experienced in working with farmers, because I'm a city boy. I was raised in Louisville. I did not grow up on a farm, surprise, um, is 
how important family is in any event. And so when, when, when I go to a grass fed exchange event, like the one at your place, people brought their kids. Mm -hmm. And, and when I go to your farm teaching, like in Unionville, Alabama, people brought their kids. Mm -hmm. And what's great about that is I've been able to do that myself in my work mm -hmm. is it's, it, I'm so grateful to the folks who've helped us because it's enabled me to bring my kids along with me uh, and be there with family. Let's round this off before Maria, I'm giving you a heads up. We're about to go to Q and A. <laughs> Talk about family. Talk about, it's, it's the holidays. Talk about family and food and everything that we've talked about. Sum it up there, my friend. Yeah. I'm gonna sum it up this way in that, that, you know, my son growing up, there was quite a large number of students that were from farms and ranches. Uh, 40 some students in his graduating class he was friends with were from farms and ranches. Today, he is the only one that's actively involved in farming and ranching and how sad that is. And so one of the big differences I see is that in regenerative agriculture, we give hope and the ability of the next generation to become involved and to be an active part. You know, that really brings me hope, hope for the future. And it's also what drives my business partners and I. We want to see all young people who have, and not just young people, any age. You know, I've had people 70 plus years old come to me and want to start down this path. Yeah. That's great. That's what we need. And I think, you know, my good friend and mentor, Ray Archuleta, always said that, tells the story how, you know, the buzzword has always been sustainable and we got to be sustainable. Well, he says, do you want your marriage sustainable or do you want it regenerative? And I think we'd all agree we want it regenerative. I, I Absolutely. You taught me that. You taught me the difference. And here I am at the School of Sustainability at ASU. And I've been, I've been angling to get that name changed for a while. I don't, haven't had purchase yet, but uh, I'm, I'm aiming for it. And that's your influence. Good. Um, one last thing I'd like to say is, um, actually, let's go to questions and I'll, 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 I'll bring in something later on. Let's go. Maria, what you got? Um, actually, Peter, the last couple of questions you had tie in really well with some of the questions that folks submitted ahead of time. So you were touching on engaging with families, engaging with communities, um, engaging within the educational sector. So Gabe, what are some of your best practices or strategies with engaging farmers and engaging communities and sharing these messages? Great question. Thank you, Maria. So one of the things, and, and I give Ray Archuleta credit for this, you know, there was always five soil health principles. So then Ray kept saying, we need a sixth. And that sixth one is context. You know, you have to farm and ranch in context with your environment. Well, also when you're approaching education, you have to do it in context of those that you're trying to teach. So we approach farmers and ranchers in their context. What makes the biggest impact on them? Well, as much as we'd like to thank farmers and ranchers are going to do this for the sake of the ecosystem and environment. Fact of the matter is it's their job and it's how they support their family. They're going to do it for profitability reasons. So when we're educating farmers and ranchers, we use that approach, show them that by, how by applying the principles and rules, they can drive the four ecosystem processes, increase their profitability. Now, when we talk to consumers, what matters to consumers? their health, of course. So then we use the approach, okay, here's why you need to source food that's grown and raised in a regenerative manner, because it'll directly positively impact your health. So Gabe, you've mentioned a couple of things, um, the six rules of soil health and the four- Ecosystem something. processes. Why don't you list those for everybody? Because yeah. I don't think we have those in this, in this podcast, in this conversation. So yeah. I often get asked, uh, well, Gabe, you know, it'll work on your farm in North Dakota, but it's not going to work on mine in New York or Arkansas or, you know, the Philippines, India, wherever the case may be. 
And I tell them, I am not 99% sure they'll work on your farm. I, I'm 100% sure because these six principles are the same for any land-based agriculture anywhere in the world. First one's context. You know, every location has its context. I tell people there's a reason bananas don't grow in North Dakota. You know, they're not gonna survive the cold. So you have to farm and ranch in your context. You have to have minimal disturbance. And by that, we mean uh, mechanical disturbance, tillage. You know, one of the things I tell gardeners all the time is, why would you go rototill a garden? That's absolutely the worst thing you can do for producing nutrient dense food, okay? And then chemical disturbance. Why would you put chemicals on something you're gonna consume, okay? Cover the soil, you know, where in nature do you see bare soil? Usually only where mankind's activity has caused it. We have to protect the soil from wind erosion, water erosion, evaporation. Just look at the pictures over the past few days of the central plains with 80 mile an hour winds and the dust bowl. We haven't done anything in the last 80 plus years. We need to get back to covering the soil. The next principle is diversity. You know, nature abhors a monoculture. It thrives on diversity. And then you have the principle of living root in the soil as long as possible throughout the year. We got to be take, able to take in that solar energy, photosynthesis, feed biology. And then the final principle is animal insect integration. So uh, ecosystems do not function properly without animals and insects. So uh, what we teach is simply these time-tested ecological principles that work anywhere in the world where there's land-based agriculture. I call it using 3.2 billion years of R&D. Yep. Why, not, why not start there? Yep. And our good That's friend right. Russ Concert says, why not give nature a seat at the table? Like, let's, let's start with that. Yep. Maria, what you got? Um, well, first, I wanted to say, Gabe, I love the idea that you're sharing information with folks in context. I, um, one of the things that I'm really interested in as principles of science communication, and honestly, I feel like without meaning to, you could be writing a book on science communication right now. So I'm so excited to hear your strategies. Um, another set of questions that we had that um, are all kind of asking the same theme is we have a lot of folks asking what are barriers to getting involved in regenerative agriculture to begin with? So what are some barriers to getting started to begin with? And what are some barriers in possibly scaling up for those who are already involved in regenerative agriculture? Sure. The, the greatest barrier in solving a problem is the human mind. You know, we think we can't do it. Well, no. You know, one of the, one of the things people, people tend to ask why, we need to ask why not. And then we need to educate ourselves. We need to understand, it goes back to what I talked about earlier, that very few farmers and ranchers truly understand just uh, how alive this soil ecosystem is and how it can thrive if we give it the chance. Yeah. Barriers to get in, uh, education, but there's often this uh, misbelief that, oh, if I go down this path, I'm going to lose income as a farmer, or there's going to be these years of transition. No, because we start in context where that farmer or rancher is at. And with Understanding Ag, we've had a great deal of success in using that approach, working with in their context. And most people, we can increase profitability the very first year. I, um, you know, I've always been told that, that the neighbors of the folks pioneering this stuff think they're a little nuts or think they're crazy and stuff like that. But in our work, we're finding out that the neighbor is actually quite curious. Mm -hmm. They're just really too polite to ask. They don't want to get inside their neighbor, the neighbor's business. And the regenerative person is too polite to tell. They don't want to toot their own horn. Um, does that ring true for you at all now, Gabe, throughout the years? Are you still seeing the neighbor thinks, thinks the, the adaptive person is crazy, the regenerative person? 
Well, realize no neighbor wants to admit that their neighbor is doing better than they are. So they're always a bit hesitant, you know, and you're not an expert unless you're over 100 miles from home, you know. Right, right. (laughs) And the thing I go back to, I believe that when I went to 100% no-till in 1994, I was the first farmer in Burley County to be 100% no-till. Now, full 80% plus of the farmers are no till. So it's being adopted widely. Now, they don't have the stacked enterprises, all of them, but that's fine if it doesn't fit their context. Mm -hmm. I'm just happy if they have growing plants (laughs) covering the soil and starting down the path. And Jay Fuhrer might be kind of part of that, right? (laughs) Uh, Jay is, Jay was a, a driving force behind soil health, not only in this county and state, but all across the world. Yeah, he's one of my teachers too. Now you're using past tense. Jay just retired. He's not gone, is he? No, he's not gone. He's here and working. Yep. Yeah. Okay, good, no. good, good. All right, Maria. <laughs> um, so we had a question that was, uh, this particular one was a little bit more specific, but I'd like to broaden it up a little bit as well. One question asked specifically, um, how can land trusts working on farmland conservations get more involved in promoting these practices and perhaps other funding sources? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, but I'd also love to hear your thoughts on how those of us who are consumers, so all of us who eat food, (laughs) who are watching this, how can we be more supportive of regenerative agriculture? How can we make sure that we're seeking out um, foods raised in these more not sustainable or regenerative ways and keep supporting the cause ourselves. So both how land trusts can get involved and then just how any of us can keep supporting it. Sure, very good question. Land trusts, uh, absentee landowners, uh, everyone can be involved in demanding that these practices are done and observed on the properties that they control. And so one of the things we work with uh, often are trusts and absentee landowners who educating them that, hey, you can make a difference in the fact that you can stipulate that those operating that land are doing so in a regenerative manner. Now, as far as consumers, that's one of education. And I'll take a moment here to put in a shameless plug, but In the very near future, there's going to be a major announcement made that uh, a business that I'm involved with is going to be offer the ability to verify regenerative practices throughout the supply chains and on farms and ranches with the hope that that will drive significant change and also stop the greenwashing that's taking place. There's a lot of talk of regenerative and how do consumers know what regenerative is and are the are these products being grows, grown and raised in a regenerative manner. Uh, stay tuned for future details, but we're going to attempt to solve that issue. Yeah, what would be so nice is, you know, not every consumer is going to have the time to go to a farmer's market and really do the research. So if you could just grab something on the shelf and it is regeneratively regeneratively grown, wouldn't that be nice if it was that easy? We're going to take it way beyond that, Peter. <laughs> Good. Awesome. All right, Maria. Well, we did also have, um, we had a number of questions that circled around using regenerative agriculture practices, either on small scale farms or at home. Um, mm-hmm our own yards, in our backyards, on our own properties, even if our properties aren't specifically agricultural. Um, So if you had some helpful suggestions for small-scale farmers and um, folks with just backyards, uh, what would be your biggest pieces of advice? So every year we get thousands of visitors to our ranch here in North Dakota. And the first place I tend to take them is to our garden. So our garden has been not been tilled in over 25 years. It's very diverse uh, in species and it has armor on the soil and it's extremely healthy. And I can show them in a garden space how all these principles can be applied. 
I speak to consumers who just have a little flower pot on a deck, like in New York City, yet they can still apply the principles. Now they're going to say, well, we don't have animals. Well, you can certainly have insects there. And so it doesn't matter the scale. At Understanding Ag, we have clients who farm in less than an acre to our largest client is over 2 million acres. Okay, everywhere in between, the principles and processes are the same. So as far as lawns is concerned, my father, <laughs> may he rest in peace, took immaculate care of his lawn. And if you couldn't see the wheel tracks of the mower, it was time to mow again. And there was never a weed on his lawn. Now today, uh, we haven't mown our lawn in eight years, I believe. I took the keys of the lawnmower away from my wife. We now allow to grow what will grow. We actually bring the cattle on, put a little fence around the house so they can't rub on it, let them graze it. What we've seen is this explosion of life. Now we have all these wildflowers and insects coming. And why can't those with lawns grow flowers and diversity and insects and, and make it something that is appealing in a different way rather than a clean mown yard? They wouldn't have to apply fertilizers and chemicals also. And they might chemicals say and about. fertilizers, which end up in our watersheds. <laughs> We're, we're right at time, Maria, to sort of wrap it up. So um, I know we wanted Gabe to get a chance to, to sum up and I'll, I'll do a little summing up and let Gabe have the last word. I know for myself, what I've learned is uh, how integral the farmer farmers are to my life and everyone's life and how pretty much ignored they are by most people. Um, and so for me, becoming an advocate for farmers has been something that has felt really good. Um, farmers are in debt. They should not be in debt. They should be profitable making us food. Um, we talked about all the different ways of if we could take our healthcare dollars and put them towards food, then farmers would get some of that money. Rural economies would get some of that money. So for me, Gabe, what you've taught me is to know about the farmer. And to know about the farmer means to care about the farmer. You can't have one without the other. And so I thank you, sir, for being a huge part of my education and a huge part of my life. And I'm so glad that the Heinz Foundation honored you. And, and, and I'm glad to be just a small part of the celebration. So thank you. Well, thank you, Peter. And, and your work, I'll never forget when Soil Carbon Cowboys came out because uh, my phone has not stopped ringing since. So thank you for that. Uh, and summing it up, I want to thank Teresa Hines and the Hines Foundation, of course, for this honor. It truly is an honor. And I hope in some small way that I carry on John Hines's legacy. Uh, I also just really want to encourage everyone out there to make a difference. Make a difference, not only in your life, your family's life, but in your community. Because, you know, just like a ripple starts in a pond from throwing a stone in, we can all start that ripple by making a difference. So thank you. Thank you so much, Gabe. And all of us who are joining here today, every human being I have ever encountered, we all need food, which means we all, <laughs> we all need the kind of expertise that you can provide. Thank you so much for doing um, such a big part of making that part of a healthy future. And again, thank you also. Um, you so are so deserving of this Heinz Award. I'm so um, thank you that the Heinz Foundation is honoring you with this. And I thank you all so much here for joining us this afternoon. <laughs> Thanks, y'all.